TV 2019 at the Gurkha booth with Mr. Juan Lopez. Juan, how you doing, brother? How you doing, brother? Hi, man. Good, good. Seeing, good seeing, like good seeing you. Listen, uh, I love the backdrop here. Of course, we love the signage on Gurkha. And, uh, of course, it reminds us of uh, little red roosters running around sometimes. <laughs> well said. It could. Well played. <laughs> well played. <laughs> and that's rare for me, brother. <laughs> so, listen. I'd like to know, you know, we've never really had a chance to do an actual interview. Um, and of course, we've got some background noise here, but frankly, you're going to be busy. I'm going to be, I, I'm skittering back later today. Okay. So give me a background on the company. What was the inspiration for the founding of the company? What was the background? Okay. So, you know, uh, so uh, Kazahan Sodia, the owner of the company, uh, was on a, on a trip, I think it was 19, 1989 or so, uh, out to Goa, India. And uh, he runs into a small little shop that says Gurkha Tobacco Merchant. So he walks in there. First of all, he's, first of all, he's a big, big historian guy. He loves history and that kind of stuff. And I was going to ask, was this, now if it was in India, it wouldn't necessarily be affiliated with Gurkhas because that's more Nepalese, but Correct. but was this associated to a Gurkha regiment or anything? It was, it was more, it was more, yes. So they, they were making cigars for the Gurkha soldiers. Ah. And they had a, their own little store. So he goes into a store and he says, I love the history. I want to buy all of your inventory that you have. Mind you, they're making crappy cigars back then because they're all made in, in India, wherever. The way we're and they're making them for their own use or maybe for, the, for guys Correct. that are in the regiment. And, yeah, yeah. So, so he goes in there and he says, um, I would like to buy the company name and all your inventory. And he bought it for $146. $146 USD. Yes, sir. Pretty crazy, you know, we're a $35 million company now, so yeah. pretty good investment, I must say. That's, so, a, that's a story kind of like the Surefire guys. You know, they were building flashlights in a garage when they crazy? started. Isn't yeah. crazy? I mean, yeah. it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Anyway, so so he so he got he got the trademark, <laughs> came back to the States, go uh, started go making cigars wrong. with uh, with uh, the Torano family. Uh, Carlos? Car Carlos? Carlos and Charlie Torano. And uh, the flagship cigar was the uh, Cognac Fuse. So he was making this Cognac Fuse cigar going around, I remember meeting Kaiser 20 some odd years ago with his ponytail back then. And he'll, he'll walk around with his briefcase with cigars. And he, he, he literally leaves the cigars on consignment in stores. Because he's charging 14, 15 bucks for these cigars. Mind you, back then in 90, yes, the most expensive cigar was seven bucks and it was a Davidoff. Right. Seven bucks back then. So and he walks into these stores and he gets stuff on consignment. And, uh, and, and he's doing it on consignment, so yeah. there's this whole trust factor that's involved. Trust factor, he believed in the product. Uh, you know, his family comes from the watch business, so he's very, very, when it comes to, to business, you know, they know, they know what they're doing. And uh, so, you know, he said, let's try it. Funny enough, a week, week, two weeks pass by, they call him back. I can't believe this thing sold, I want, I want more. So that's how Gurkha started the distribution of Gurkha cigars. Within a few weeks? Within a few weeks. What, what, what's an back. example of like what he was leaving for consignment? Like a, a box, two he'll, boxes? He'll leave, he'll leave 30 cigars with a, a little uh, display case right. with the infused uh, cognac tubes. And uh, yeah, it was impulse buy, if you were impulse. It was different, no one was doing it back then. So it's like, you know, pretty much like what, what Acid, Acid and Drew Sway did. Uh, Large Teton used to do it first, but they perfected it kind of thing. So that's what he that's what he did. And, uh, and so we started with that, and then now, you know, now we have over you know 100, 100 some odd brands, uh, about you know 15 brick and mortar brands. Now. That's what we concentrate on selling to the brick and mortar stores. And uh, yeah, man, so it's, it's it's a fun ride. I've been with the company for nine years, and uh, I see the the progression of the company keep growing. And uh, just announced, you know, Jim Colucci became our president. Who again? Jim Colucci, uh, the former vice president of uh, Altadas, uh, which he's also the president of Sindicato. So he just became our president, and uh, I think he's a great add-on for the company. Smart guy, knows the business, very organized. So we need we need to need something like that. And uh, and uh, yeah, man, we're, we keep we keep growing. You know, we keep concentrating on making great cigars. We've always been known for great packaging. We still have great packaging, but now we got much better smokes than we used to back in the day. Better quality control absolutely, and, and absolutely, the whole thing. Absolutely. What was the now? Granted, you've been with the company for about seven, eight years. Nine. Nine okay. Um, it, historically, what, to the best of your knowledge, because part of that may be hearsay on your part, where you heard from you know the, the original players, what was the biggest challenge for Gurkha Cigars? When I got to the company, man, the, our biggest challenge was that we sold a lot of cigars online. Mm. So then the brick and mortar stores weren't happy about that because what happens when you sell online? These guys are buying millions of dollars, millions of cigars, right? And 
obviously going to get a better price point. You make less margins on our end, but they still they make their margins on their end. We you're still talking, you know, 15 pack of Gurkha cigars at CI for 29.99, stuff like that. Yeah, that's a huge challenge for us. So that's why when Gary Himes, he used to be the old president CEO, came to work for us. Um, you know, we, we sat down and, and uh, came up with a brick and mortar idea. You know, that's where we, we developed the cellar, the, the cellar reserve line. And uh, if you buy it in the cigar store, you, you can only get a cigar store. You cannot buy it online. So that was huge for us. So that was our biggest obstacle was finding the online. Because if you go online and it's got the Gurkha name on it and it's a, a $2 cigar, why would you pay 12 Now, with this kind of stuff, brick and mortar, we concentrate more on our tobaccos, higher grade tobacco. It's a little bit different and more consistent. And you're supporting that brick and mortar <laughs> owner as well, absolutely. He, helping to keep him in the loop Absol or him or her. Absolutely, and, um, and for us it was more than anything, it was more of a, uh, um, the mentality was the Cubans are coming, right? Yeah. So if you don't have your, your spot in the humidor, while the, when the Cubans will come eventually, you're, you're gonna lose because they're gonna, there's gonna be products that are gonna be taken out of the humidor to put the Cubans in. So the mentality was always, if I could put 25 facings in American Motor stores, I'll, I'm okay with losing five and keeping 20. But I, at least I got some skin in the game. Right. Back then when I got here, it was 10 SKUs, five SKUs in the stores, maybe. So if Cubans come, you're done. So that's when you go brick and mortar. So if you buy it a brick and mortar, you support them, they become your, your partners. Right. And there's a loyalty. And there's in, in, in the cigar business, in the tobacco business, the tobacconist business, there's a huge, oh, this is a passionate type of a pastime Absolutely. and a passionate business. Um, you know, the guys that just get into it on a corporate level, you know, they're kind of flash in the pants. You know, they're in, they're out or whatever. But, you know, the guys who are really, like you said, skin in the game, there's a commitment there. Like we like to say, my guys, we like to say, you know, commitment leaves a mark. <laughs> and if you look at me, you can see I got a few. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and that transitions into a, a business model like cigars. Right. And so, so now you mentioned the Cubans are coming. With that, re in that regard, you know, there's been a lot of fluff about that. And of course, when, you know, uh, things were opened up, trade was opened up a little bit a few years back, there was this big swell in the, I don't want to say industry, but in the, in the community, you know, the cigar community, I think maybe that's more appropriate than industry. Right. Uh, and I'm going to get myself tongue-tied a little bit, but you know what I'm saying. That it's more sense. of a community. So there's this huge swell about Cubanos, Cubanos, Cubanos. Cubans are coming. The Cubans are coming. You know, I've had Cubans. You've had Cuban cigars. Uh, frankly, I like Dominicans. I like, you know, I don't, I don't really see, other than just that name recognition, or the the splash aspect of ooh, this is a, a Cuban cigar. Well, again, it goes back to the whole forbidden fruit thing, right? You know, if you can't get it, you want it. They're, they were the originators. Yeah, they were the originals. Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. Right. So I got a quick Cuban story for you. I'm in Germany two years ago. Sorry, Switzerland two years ago. And uh, my name is Juan Lopez. Some people, some people would say it's one and the same, but we're. Yeah, no, <laughs> A little different, but yeah, we're just breaking the balls of the, of, of, of the of the it's Europeans all, a little absolutely. bit. Yeah, yeah. So I go into a store that carries Gurkhas, right? And um, it's got Tom Portman, a good friend of mine now. And, um, and I go, hey Tom, I want to buy a box of the Juan Lopez. My name uh, uh, is Swiss edition, Swiss edition. It's a Solomon size, 10 count box. Oh, Mr. Lopez, no problem. Um, it's 350 euro for 10 cigars. I'm okay, whatever. It is what it is. He brings out 10 boxes. And I go, Tom, I wanted 10 cigars, one box. He goes, no, Mr. Lopez. I just want to make sure that, number one, they all look the same color, and they would draw when you tell because they're all tight. If you do it in the United States, you're out of business. Exactly. You're out of business. So, so that, that's my question, and just, just an opinion thing, if you don't mind. What is your opinion of once Cubanos become available in the States? I think, I think I, there'll be, I, I, you, know, be, you tell me first what you think. To me, to me, it's gonna be a quick rush. It's gonna be that, that, that a small little boom, but the people are gonna realize that number one, you're gonna pay 30 bucks a stick. Start with that. Number two, Nicaragua and Dominican have much better quality tobacco. That's aged. Cubans don't age anything. They have erosion in their soil. They don't turn the soil. It's, it's, it, there's no potassium or magnesium in the soil anymore because they don't give a shit. Whatever they buy, whatever they, they grow, they sell because that's what they do. Because people do. will buy them. People will buy them, yeah. correct. Namesake, you know? Yeah. So to me, I think, I, I think it'll be a good thing for the cigar industry. Um, 
<laughs> because I think people will realize that Nicaragua and Dominican is much better tobacco so you think at a the end, price point. You think the end users will be able to actually truly appreciate they can, they can, the Nicaragua and the Dominican the cigars. 40 years. Right, it's kind of like coming to the realization. Correct. It's kind of like a, a good wine, you know, you, uh, same thing. I and mean, I, go, go back to wine. Right. Yeah. Wine was what? French, Italian, Chilean, Spanish, Napa. Napa? 30 years ago? Mendocino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Oregon? Really? Now they're Napa's the number one selling uh, region of wine in the, in the world. I mean, it's crazy, but... Yeah, and those are, there's, those, are those turns and twists in the in the industry. I personally think it's going to be, once they do become legal in the States, I think it's going to be very similar to cannabis. You know, there's that whole, you know, people that have been waiting and waiting with bated breath right. to be able to legally indulge in that. Right. You know, there'll be this big rush, there'll be a lot of investment, there'll be a lot of capital being changing hands, and then I think it's going to, I think exactly the same thing that you yes. just mentioned. It'll go back to, hey, we really appreciate this uh, Dominican cigar or this Nicaraguan cigar, you know. 100% right. Now, your background, what is your background in cigars? All right, so, uh, and, and let's even go back before that, before you got into cigars. What, right, so, a little bit about, about you. So, uh, graduated college, I, I got a job um, selling uh, advertising in the, in, in the uh, automotive industry. So, did that for about a year and a half. Um, got into the cigar business, literally, I applied for, for a job just because I, I hated wearing suits and in Miami weather, 90 degrees, wearing suits and dealing with general managers. Where these guys, general manager with car dealership, man, it's like, yeah, it's a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a glorified sales guy that yeah. became a G GM kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, and uh, so I did that for a few years. Worked for Caribbean Cigars. Started in 1996 with Caribbean Cigars. Uh, Caribbean went public. That lasted about a year. Kevin Doyle, the owner. Money, Things change. All that, you know, yeah. happened. Then I went to work for the Taranos. So I, went, I worked for Carlos Taranos for 12 years. I was their first rep in, uh, at Taranos, myself and Mike Gann, actually. And his story is phenomenal. I've actually interviewed yeah. him a very long time ago. And uh, yeah, His well, story was, was just uh, phenomenal. Incredible. And uh, great people. So they, uh, I started with them. They moved distribution to CAO. Um, oh, shit, it's been a long time now, like 12 years, 10 years ago. And uh, that's when I'm, I went. I went to work for Rocky Patel as the national sales director for a year and a half. That was great uh, learning experience with Rocky Nation Nemish, my brother still. Uh, then I came to Gurkha, and when I went to Gurkha, it was literally. Um, I said, I go to Kaiser. I go, listen, give me, give me every account that you don't sell to. Let me see what I can do with it. No problem, Juan. Here you go. My first year sold one and a half million dollars. My second year became sales director, and now VP of sales. Been with it for nine years, so pretty much I've been in the cigar business now for 23 years, and, and, I, and, and climbing love, still. And I love what I do, man. And it's a and it's a fun industry. It's a. I always tell my reps: sell yourself first, then you sell the product. Yeah. Because people buy from people at the end right. of the day. And if you make a good quality product, it should sell itself. But you gotta sell yourself first. So. Exactly. You have to have that connection. And by the way, salute. I mean, on 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 your. Uh, your rocketing, so to speak, Absolutely. through the industry, we're doing, we're doing good, and yeah. We're doing all right. <laughs> and the other thing, too, is, you know, even though there's the competitors, you mentioned some of the other companies, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of like that odd duck family situation where the turkey goes skittering across the floor at man, Thanksgiving. You, you, you know, know what? I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, man. I, I don't think this competition, the one competition is healthy. All right, mm -hmm. it really is. But our industry is such a small industry that, you know, people don't understand that we, what. 1.2% of the population smoke premium cigars. That's it. Yep. We're small, small niche kind of community. It's like and a family, but it's like you guys are all cousins no, or something, you know? Exactly. Yeah. We're all friends. We're all brothers. We love each other. We hang out with each other. I go to events for every manufacturer coming in town. I'll do an event. And I'll, I'll buy a box. Yep. Because I like to smoke everybody's cigars too, not just ours. You know? Right. And, and again, these are, these are my boys. These are my, my boys, my, my family. You've got history with them. Absolutely, man. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's what I love about the industry. I, the one thing I've always said about the cigar business, it's the only industry that you can be sitting next to an unemployed guy and a rich guy, and they get along because of this. You're right. And I love that. You go to a cigar lounge or a club anywhere, you see that all the time. And it, and it doesn't matter, it, it does not matter what country you're in either. Listen, man, there's, there's, in the cigar industry, man, there's no color, there's no race. It's all about the leaf. It's all about enjoying a great cigar, a nice, you know, scotch, bourbon, whatever you like to drink. Um, conversation. The camaraderie. Oh, man, that's that's what it's all about in our business. So now listen, brother, what is your favorite uh, spirit? <coughs> I'm, a, I'm a Johnny Walker blue guy. Um, I like black a lot, too. My grandfather turned me on to it. 
when I was 16 years old, uh, this is a quick little story you'll enjoy. So, I'm 16, and we're at, we're at Noche Buena, which is uh, Christmas Eve, and uh, we're, we're drinking. I'm drinking a 7 7, right? 16, I'm already drinking a 7 7. Of course. And my grandpa used to drink uh, Johnny Red. So he come up to me, and, uh, and when you're Cuban, they call you by your middle name, so my name is Juan Miguel. So he goes, Miguelito, what are you drinking? I go, Abuelo, I'm having a 7 7. He goes, 7 <laughs> Eleven, isn't that a store? <laughs> and I go, I go, no. And he did that face, right? Hey, yeah, he did. 7 Eleven, <laughs> isn't that a store? I go, no, no. It's a Canadian whiskey with, with 7 Up. He goes, let me try that sheet. He gets it, he goes, he goes, are you a man or are you a mice? <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? He goes, real man drink Johnny Walker Red. So mind you, now I'm in high school, yeah. a sophomore drinking Johnny Walker, and everybody's drinking Schlitz, Paps, and shit. Yeah, yeah. Drinking beer, drinking scotch. Yeah. So I've been, always been a big scotch guy. I like bourbons. Uh -huh. uh, my guy, my, my teammates are turning me into the bourbon. Um, I like a wine with a good steak. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Almost I'm, always with a meal. Yeah. Always. And, uh, and I'm a big, I'm a big Scotch guy, man. I, I like Balbini, 14-year Caribbean cask. You know, <laughs> you know. Uh, there's a lot of. I should have brought a bottle and walked around oh, with it. I got one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Caribbean cask is phenomenal stuff. Goes well with cigars. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. No, because it's got that sweetness to which I love. Yeah, yeah. And, man, Lagavulin. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic as well. But uh, again, man. Uh, I'm a, everybody knows me in the industry. I'm a, I like to drink. I like to have fun. But yeah. you know what? As long as you show up the next day and go to work, you'll be fine. You'll be exactly. successful. Exactly. So, and you probably learned that from your grandfather too, uh, right? Yeah, man. You know, I never had a dad. My dad passed when I was three years old. So mm -hmm. my grandfather was my dad to me. And yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah man. This is my man, you know? Yeah. You tell my kids. Listen, girls. I got three girls. Ah, uh, the curse. Uh, it's beautiful having girls, but still, you know, the curse, right? It's what yeah, it yeah. Is, yeah. It is what it is. Listen, if you have... If I would have had a boy, it would have been at the strip joint with me at 14 years old. So maybe that, that's a good thing, right? So, so I like I like tell my girls, listen, you guys are only practice. I never had a father. Mm. You're practice because I'm going to be the best grandfather in the world. They're like, Dad, you're a great dad. I go, no, I'm a, I'm a good dad. I'm a great provider. Yeah. It's a difference. But you know what? The fact that you put that effort into it, that's the key. Try, am try. I right or am I wrong? Listen, man, I, I get up every morning. What drives me, motivates me is my kids. Yeah. I want the best of my kids. I want my kids to succeed. And whatever I could do as a, anyone could be a father, not everyone could be a dad. You know what? And I don't even think that that even applies. Anybody can produce a child. Well, right. not, no, some guys can't, but right. I mean, you know, almost anybody can produce a child. But it takes a man, not a male, it takes a man yes, to be a father Absolutely and to right. be a dad. Yes, sir. Salute. Pleasure. Listen. Juan, I don't want to have, I don't want to hear you crowing in the morning, okay? Nah, nah. <laughs> Listen, you travel safe home, okay, brother? Thank you, my brother. All Good the best. You, like always.